sins of the Philistines. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord, with your matchless, glorious, powerful word, the words of our creator to your creation, Lord. These are the words we need to hear. This is the information we need to hear and digest and listen to, Father. Lord, give the winds a mighty voice and speak through your powerful word today to our hearts, piercing, comforting, guiding, correcting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As, and as I've been telling you guys, you know, over the last couple of weeks, I've really been pounding this. You know what? There's so many places to get news. You hear news all the, all the time. And I'm telling you, you come, you're part of a small church. God has called the church to present the good news. You know, did you ever think about that? The church is a news agency, right? We are to bring the good news. Okay, the Christian broadcast system, I guess you could call it. I think there was a quick, yeah, it's not CNN. <laughs> we're going to change, we're going to hijack the church news network. And we are going to proclaim the good news because you're getting bombarded with just pain and suffering. And you just, oh, you're all worried. You're all concerned. It's making you tremble. You can't enjoy life. And God has called the local church with the local pastor. And what is our job? What's my job? People, I put the effort in all week long. I pray. And I don't just throw these things together. I seek. I say, God, what do you want me to tell your people? That's my job. So if you want to hear what God has to say to you, okay, listen to the service. Listen, you know, and every pastor and every church is responsible for his sheep. You want to hear what's going on? You want to know what to do and how to handle your problems? Well, please pray for me before you get here that I would say what God wants me to say. Pray for your hearts that you would receive what God wants you to receive and pray for everyone else. So this morning's message is... He will deliver you. Today, the words you need to hear, the words you must have. Doesn't that sound good? He will deliver you. You're not hearing that on the news. You're not hearing it. And what does it mean? It means that no matter what, no matter what, you are going to be delivered. But in order to understand this, and I know a lot of churches talk about deliverance, and this is not a deliverance service, because only God delivers. I don't. But in order to understand why I use that term deliverance, well, we need to understand a couple of things before we get to what that deliverance is. Number one is to be delivered. What does that mean to be delivered? Well, before you can get to the you know, the part two or the result, you first need to get through the door, which is you must serve him. Do you know you can't be delivered and sustained if you're not serving God? If you're hiding under a bed, you're not serving God. He can't deliver those who are hiding under a bushel. And number two, to understand what does it mean to be delivered? What is this deliverance that I'm talking about this morning? So we're going to read a lot of scriptures. This is a Bible church. We read the Bible. It's the Word of God. And if you guys, if you didn't listen to this morning's Sunday school, adult Bible study of Brother John DiPartola, on if you have any doubt in your mind that this is the Word of God, our theologist just in 2019 and recently in the news, it's it's true, okay? It's undeniable. The Word of God, the Bible, is a thousand percent true. The archaeologists have dug up stuff. They found things. The evidence is there. Exactly what God said is what God did. The proof is there. The Bible is the truth. Whether we believe it and trust it, it's up to us. So let's see what the Bible says. In 1 Samuel chapter 7 Verses 3 and 4. And Samuel, this is the prophet Samuel, he's a real prophet. And Samuel spoke unto all the house of Israel and saying, and notice you always see this point counterpoint. You always see this joining of a promise and a receiving of the promise based upon what you do with what you hear from it. Saying, if ye do return unto the Lord. Interesting. 
How many of us have drifted away? How many of us drift away from God? It happens, people. And what is God? You know, God is the God of grace, and he's saying, return. Return to me, because you're not going to get any help out there. If you return unto the Lord with all, he doesn't say, you know, put your foot in the door. With all your heart. It's funny, we listen to the news with all of our hearts, don't we? When you go to the movie, to watch your favorite movie, you listen with all of your ears. But for some reason, when it comes to God, yeah, yeah, God, you're great, yeah, okay, got your thumbs up. God said, no, I don't satis I'm not satisfied with that. And I don't think you would be either. If you were in a relationship, a marriage, many people tell me, you know, why are they upset about their marriages? Because the other person has just got their foot in. Yeah, I love you, yeah. You know I do. No, that doesn't, I want all of it. Do you want someone in your life who just has a little bit of time for you? A little bit of love for you? No, you want all of it. And God demands all of it. If you return unto the Lord with all your heart, then you need to do something. Prove it. Put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Now, obviously, this is God speaking to Israel and what was going on back then. But by application, these are the things that are blocking us from God. They are what we, what are some strange gods in our lives today? They're the th anything you put your trust in more than God is a God. Yeah, I know what the Bible says, but science says this, or the politicians say this, and this one says this. I'm going to trust them. God says, then they're your gods. You trust me first, them second. Put away these strange gods and prepare your heart. People, we need to prepare our hearts, and I'm going to be saying this all the time now. When you come to church, or when you're on your way here, get prepared. Say, God, give me ears to hear. You've given me two. I've got no excuse. If you lost an ear, you got another one. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. Who do you serve? People, we serve a lot of things. I serve a lot of things. God says, He's got to be the main thing you serve. And it says, and serve him. And that's why I'm tying together serving and delivering. Serve him only and he will. He will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. And the Philistines were an enemy of Israel, but they could be anything that's destroying your faith today. Anything that's bringing you to your knees. You feel okay, but you know, you're doing okay. You love God. But did you hear about the news? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? How are we going to make it? If that has your ear, God can't have your ear. You've got to get 100% in line here. Then the children of Israel did put away their gods, Balaam and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. So it's clear that to serve God and be delivered by God, we must love God with all of our hearts. And he's not kidding. Matter of fact, really the central part of this message this morning, though it's about deliverance, it's really about loving God. People are like, what does God want from me? Love. He wants your love. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, going up a couple of chapters, only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth. Interesting, serve Him in truth. Can you serve God and be a liar? Yeah, God is great. I love him. Uh, I belong to the Center Reach Bible Church. I am so happy. God says, you are lying. You don't love me. You don't trust me. You're crumbling in fear. Serve him in truth, because God knows the truth, with all your heart. Why? For consider how great things he has done for you. Well, what has God done for me? If you have to ask that question, then you don't know him yet. Meaning, loving and serving God is based on understanding what God has done for you first. What has God done for you already that is the most important thing? Salvation. Forgiveness, people. 
That is the big one. That's the elephant in the room. And if you're not excited about that, and if you want to see me get excited, you can listen to last week's Bible study, okay? As I spoke about how intense should we be about this forgiveness. Make sure you listen to that. That's part five of why I was wrong, why you need to know the 10 sins and confessions of a pastor. As I understand, understood something that God was trying to show me. So we need to understand first that God is offering us forgiveness. But if you don't think you need it, it's no big deal. But if you want it, it's there. And that's the first step through the door that begins things happening. But what's another thing that God is looking for? Looking for from you and from me. To turn to him, and here it is again. We just said that, Pastor. I'm going to say it again. Love him. Really, really, really love him. Really ask yourself, do I really love God? Because if I did, I think my life would be a lot different. Do you know, when you go through the Bible, and we're seeing through these scriptures, you know, people, religions throughout the eons of time have come up with ways of what they think God wants. And this religion says you wear a hat and spin around three times, and that religion says you don't eat this on Friday, and that religion says you've got to be nice to old ladies or whatever. They all got something. Because I want to appease the gods. God says, you want to appease me? Love me. Do you realize that's the hardest thing to do? I can go, I'm not, I'm not eating chocolate for a week. <laughs> That'll show God how much I'm into this thing. God says, keep your chocolate. Eat as much as you want. Do you love me? In Matthew 10, 37, Jesus, God in the flesh. And people, before I even read this, do you understand that defines who we are? If you love something, people will know what you love. Okay? If you're into cars, people will know. You know, you guys know I like Jeeps. You know that. Okay? Because I'm into it. You know I like cars. You know that. It's evident. You don't have to ask, oh, what's, uh, what's past this uh, hobby? You know, you know it because it emanates from me. It, it, just, it just emotes from me. Do people know we love God? Know what the worst thing you could ever hear from somebody? Oh, I never knew you were a Christian. You could have fooled me. <laughs> really? You're a Christian? Can you imagine if someone says that to you and they've known you for a while? That's a great insult. It's a great insult. Because if people know I like cars and I like Jeeps, but they don't know I love Jesus Christ, then something's wrong with me. Matthew 10, 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You know what? God is not playing any games here. Because if you love your husband more than God, if you love your wife more than God, if you love your children more than God, if you love your home, you love your lawn, you love your country more than God, you cannot love God properly. Because he is below. He's not on the top. He's on the bottom. And God knows it. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, God's not playing. That's, that's pretty strong, Jesus. Yeah, I'm not fooling around. He that finds, oh, excuse me, verse 38. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. People argue about what's taking your cross. But I tell you, if your problem, your issue, your hang up is bigger than your love from God, then... That's going to keep you from God. God's saying, whatever your state in life is, you were born with this problem, with that problem. Your, your life happens to be a situation that you can't change. Just bring that with you and follow me. Don't let that keep you from me. Because no one has an excuse. He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Kind of an interesting scripture, kind of like a riddle. If things in your life are your life, then that's who you are. Because those who come to Christ, all of a sudden life becomes secondary. And you're like 
once I found Jesus Christ. Everything else, really, it can come or go. But God is everything. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, him that sent me, and he that sent me. We're going to go to Deuteronomy. Our brother John was talking about Deuteronomy. I'm going to read quite a bit here. Okay. Chapter 11, verse 13. Notice one of the, you, know, you see this throughout the scriptures. If, 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 you now people often argue that, you know, you have no freedom to choose. God already has everything preordained. Well, then why does he use the word if? He always uses the word if, meaning if you do this, I'll do that. Meaning you have a choice to decide what you're going to do with God. In Deuteronomy eleven thirteen, and it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day. And listen what God says. Give up this, give up that, don't do this. You know the first thing he says? To love the Lord your God. And to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He's not, he's not giving us any wiggle room here. He said, you know what, what is it, uh, I, I think it's in uh, Samuel, right? What, is it, what does it say? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, I gave up this for God and I gave, God says, keep you giving up stuff. Love me. Love me. Verse 14, that I will give you, now if we love God with all of our hearts and we diligently, diligently seek him and obey his commandments, verse 14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the later rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full but look at verse 16 but take heed this is a warning this morning we learned in the adult bible study there are some things god says cursed be you if you do not obey the laws i have given you cursed be the nation we say god bless the nation god says cursed is the nation who goes against my laws because you will not have food you will not have rain you will not have what you need because i bless verse 16 of Deuteronomy 11 take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived people can our hearts be deceived I tell you I've been deceived these last three years so much running around in fear God says you can be deceived thinking that you found your little safe niche I'm going to be safe here and you run to something else instead of God. Because if you run to something else, what are you doing to God? You're running away from Him. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not conceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. You can say, well, I don't worship any other gods. Anything that you put more faith in than God is your God. Your money, your health, whatever it is. And then the Lord's wrath shall be kindled against you. We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. Upset a lot of people on my Bible studies there. The wrath of God. Anger. Why is God angry? Why would God be angry? He's a loving God. Well, and I've said this before on our Bible study. If you have children, you love them. Can you be angry at your children and love them at the same time? Angry when you see them making foolish mistakes, getting involved in things they should never get involved in. Aren't you frustrated when you've given them a great life? You set up, you set them to school, you've done all these things and they throw it all away. Doesn't that get you angry? But it doesn't mean you don't love them. God sees the foolishness of us being deceived and trusting in things and he goes, oh, poor children. I am so angry because you should know better. And the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shall shut up the heavens. People, I think we're living in a day today where the showers of God's blessing upon our nation are being shut up. Not by God, but by us 
by rejecting him and not standing up and saying, no, I am standing up for Jesus Christ. I am standing up for God. And I will not let evil be a part of my nation and my family and my home and my heart. It starts with our heart. And God shall shut up the heaven and there shall be no rain and that the land will yield no fruit. No matter what you do, you invest, do everything. We're going to fix this. God says, nothing's going to work. Lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord gave you. Isn't it amazing how quickly you can have something and how quickly it can be gone? I worked my whole life for this. And God says, in the blink of an eye, it's all gone. Because I'm the only one who provides good. Because I'm the only one who has the power to do so. Verse 18, check this out. Therefore, these are, if you know, you study grammar, these are powerful words. Therefore, meaning because of what I just said in verses 13 through 17. Listen to my words. It says in the King James, you shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul. And bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your eyes. Teach them to your children. Speak of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you get up. God's saying, if you love me, tell your children about me. When you get up in the morning, talk about me. During the middle of the day, think about me. When you go to bed at night, talk about me some more. Flood your home, flood your family, flood your nation, flood your town with the word of God. Deuteronomy 13 verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you. Whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. God is like stuck on this. Why does he keep saying this? And what is, what is God talking about? That prophet, that dreamer. People, we are living in a world where we are listening to all people talking. This person, this psychic, this guy, this, you know, they have all these panels. Every time something happens in the news, they, they get together this panel of these big big egg heads and they sit there oh, I think this is what's going on and I think this is what we need to do yeah I'm gonna listen to this person yeah I'm gonna listen to this musician tell me about what's wrong with the world or this movie star yeah I think Britney Spears knows what's going on I think I'm gonna follow her lead you know and and when they're gone some other movie star comes up and uh, all of a sudden we're like yeah I'm gonna follow Johnny Depp he's gonna be my new God I think he's the cool guy now God says, you foolish people, because I'm going to prove you. What does that mean? Now, again, this is by interpretation. God is speaking to Israel and what's going on back then. Application today. He's got, I'm going to prove you. You say, I know God, I love you so much. God said, yeah, I'm going to prove you. I'm going to pull away this. I'm going to pull away that. And if you're left standing with a smile on your face, then you love me. If I pull out these things from you and you are miserable and you crumble to the ground, then those are the things that held you up. Hey, God's getting a little bit out of control here. Is it? No, he wants to be loved. Isn't that, you know, when, you, when you're dating someone, you go back to those years when you were a couple and stuff, and you want to test the person that you're in a relationship with. I wonder if they really love me. You know, I'm going to check their phone. I want to check their history. When somebody nice walks by, I want to see they look at them and they look at me. Okay. You want to know, especially if you're going to get married, don't you want to, ah, I guess they love me. No, you want to know, this person loves me. And I love them. And I'm not afraid to be tested. God will prove to know whether you love the Lord with all your, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. The voice that you will obey is the one that you follow. And ye shall serve him and cleave to him. Look at those three points there. Obey his voice, serve him, 
and cleave unto him. What's the word cleave? You hold on to God like nothing else. Like you're in a sinking ship and it's a piece of lumber that floats by. You're holding on to it. But if you hold on to something more tightly than you do to God, you're not cleaving to them. God doesn't just suggest this. He demands it. Let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me. Notice God is constantly concerned when we go away from him. What does he say? Come back to me. We turn away from him. He says, come back to me. Is God concerned with our nation? Yeah, we've turned to one side instead of turning back to God. What are we, you know, know what's going on? You know what you got to do? Turn back to God. Nation turns back to God. Everything turns around, people. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> Turn ye unto me with all your heart. Gee, God can't let go of this, can he? With all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. This is interesting. Don't put on a show of how serious you love God. I want to see it in the heart. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is graceful, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great in kindness, and he repents of the evil. Meaning we should be so overwhelmed what, with what God has done for us through salvation that we can't help getting emotional about it. People, when you get something new, when you find something new in your life, did you, I mean, I get a new car or something, I'm like that. I, you got to come see my stuff, man. You look really excited today. I am. This has made you real happy. It has. Well, do we ever get that excited about what God has given us? Oh, yeah, what has he given me? Oh, yeah, salvation, forgiveness for sins, eternal life with him. Yeah, that's great and everything. People, you should get emotional and you should get loud and passionate. Why? Because if you can't help but cry out for those who don't know, if people are in a burning building, you know, you know, and, and you see them playing outside and they're not looking behind you, you don't say uh, in a whisper, I think your house is on fire. No, you get, hey! If you want to hear what I'm talking about, sometimes people complain uh, Wednesday night. I get a little bit passionate. We were talking about being saved from eternal separation from God through the cross. People, that's not a little thing. If that doesn't move you and say, thank you, Lord. No matter what happens in this world, thank you that when I die, and when you die, if you know Christ, I'm going to be with him forever. My sin, I tell you, my sins are forgiven and I sin every day. Uh, that's the most important thing to be thankful for. But what happens? Let's be honest. Can this happen to you? It's happened to me. We forget what God has already given. We forget how much we need Him. Boy, the last couple of years have taught us how much we really need Him, hasn't it? We forget how much He longs to be loved by us. We forget what we are spared because of His Son on the cross who took the curse for us but what happens when we do that you know what happens two things we become foolish and we become ignorant you know how i know that because psalm 32 i mean 72 22 says so foolish was i psalm 73 22 and ignorant i was as a beast before thee running around crazy forgetting my god in a panic mode Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. This is a great, a great scripture, great Psalm 73, 22. We need to really read this in the morning. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire be, beside thee. Is there anything on earth you desire more than God? That's your God. My flesh and my heart fails. Do you know 
our flesh is failing. I hear about it all the time. You ask my wife as I moan and groan. My knee hurts. My hip hurts. I got to throw at the boat. <laughs> you don't want to get a man sick because we're, we're really bad with this stuff. My flesh and my heart fails. Those are facts, people. I hate to tell you. You're going to get sick and you're going to die eventually lest the rapture come, right? But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. People, if we're far from God, if you don't know him, you're not going to make it. You're going to be destroyed under the weight of all this negativity and news. Thou shalt, thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. Wow, God is not, what does that mean? He goes a whoring from thee? If our nose gets a scent of something and it quickly pulls us away from God, boy, you know what? We are so easily hooked in the nose or hooked in the mouth like a fish and easily pulled away from our God. Verse 28, but the psalmist says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. But we may say, and you might say to me, but pastor, I don't know why you keep saying this. I love God. Why do you keep questioning this? Why does God keep questioning this? Because God keeps saying it, people. And God replies back to this. If you have any question about what I, I'm teaching this morning, in Isaiah 29, verse 13, this is in the New Living Translation, it says, And so the Lord says, well, I tell you, this scripture here, oh boy, it's really cutting. And it cuts my heart because God reminds me of this. Isaiah 29, 13. And the Lord said, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship, you know, today's a, a, a big world, you know, most of the churches, everybody's worship, worship. You know, put the Bible away, man. Let's just worship all day. And you know what God says? And their worship of me amounts to nothing more than human laws learned by rote. Repetition. Raise the hand. You're great, Jesus. We love you. And because of this, verse 14. Now, it's a strange thing. God says, I will do wonders among these hypocrites. Okay? You want that? You can have that. But they're going to come up dry. Those who sell a lie. I will show that human wisdom is foolish and even the most brilliant people lack understanding. I think we've seen that lately in the news, right? People, words matter to God. But even more than words, what's deep in our hearts. So loving Him is way up there to God. Because from that love for Him, if you truly love someone or something, you'll serve it. You'll put your effort into it. You like something, you'll be on there scrubbing it, watching it, you love it, you know? Serving is one of the signs of loving. You could ask my wife. I serve her so much around the house. <laughs> uh, I don't. I do love her, but I got to serve. <laughs> she certainly serves me a lot more than I serve her, and it's... And I get myself in trouble. <laughs> but it's true if you love something. Oh, let me help you with this. Let me help you with that. Isn't it funny when we first, when we're going out, when we first get married? Is it before we get married? What can I do for you, honey? I love you so much. I can make you flowers and all these things. Then after you get married, ah, go get it yourself. <laughs> We've gotten to the part, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you have a good marriage. We don't even exchange, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day card. Ah, you know how I feel about you. But sometimes we need to hear it, but we need to see it. God's tired of hearing how much we love him. He wants to see it. 
Put some skin in the game. Where's the effort? But how about this deliverance part? We got a couple of minutes left. You when you came here, you want to know, well, why is God going to deliver me? I want to be delivered. People, deliverance of God is a promise to those who are His. And this is what I mean. Or I should say what I don't mean. Because you might say, okay, so God promises to deliver me. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean sickness is always going to be healed. It doesn't mean that poverty is always going to end in wealth. It doesn't mean that broken marriages are always going to be repaired. Because always remember, there's two people, you know what, and if two people are not pulling, no matter what you do. It doesn't matter, doesn't mean that problems will always go away. It doesn't mean that depression will always be turned to joy. That nations will always be turned back to God and be blessed. That can happen. And most of the time, it does. Most of the time, it does. These can all happen in Christ. Remember, it's, if, if, if you're not built on that rock, it's not going to happen. But what if they don't? Because that's what you want to know. Yeah, well, what if I get sick and, and I have a problem? God still promises deliverance. And I'm going to tell you how. It's like, well, first of all, you have to understand this. Do you know that problems are part of living? Do you know the minute you were born, you had a problem? What was the first thing you did when you came out of that womb? Cried. You came out crying. <laughs> that should have been a clue. <laughs> and what's the first thing your mother did? Comfort you. People, we came out <laughs> born into this world crying it should have been like i said a clue but your parents your mother comforted those tears so problems might not always go away in this world you're going to have tribulation but be of good cheer god says i have overcome this world you see but what god promises and this is what he's talking about here he does promise to deliver you from where you are to where you need to be now we're going to say that a couple of times because it's not just clever talking. It really is something. Remember, God has a plan for your life. He has a point A and a point B. Whatever we put in the middle of that, that we choose to get involved in, that deters us or from, detours us from where we need to go, sometimes God will allow those things to happen. But at the end of the day, his one promise is in Christ is you will get from where you are to where you need to be. And where do you need to be? Closer to Him. He's going to use problems or the blessings for one thing. And they'll only be good in your life if they bring you closer to Him. That is the, the, the divine promise of God. No matter what you're facing, God will bring you from where you are to where you need to be. He will deliver you from where you are to where you need to be. From this side to that side. Because that side is where you always need to be. God will use whatever it takes to bring you from this side to that side to where you need to be. And where do you need to be, people? In His arms. Because if you're not in your arm, His arms, you're flailing and you're afraid and you're in a panic mode. Now we're going to finish up as quickly as I can, I apologize. We're going to go to Mark, and I want to get this point because it's it's really important. And I realize it would take this long to get here, but Mark chapter four, verse thirty-four through forty-one, and it says, "But without a parable spoke spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples." Jesus spoke in parables parables many times object lessons things that well, you know he talked about birds and seeds and fishes and all those things and his apostles will be going what the heck is he talking about i'm giving you an example something simple to explain a complicated point because you ain't that smart and this the same day when the evening when night was come he said unto them jesus said unto them let us pass over unto the other side. 
Now, if you remember anything from today, remember God's promise. He's telling us, let us get from here over to there. And all you have to worry about is trusting me to do it. But what happened to them? What happened to them? They were, you know, and I was thinking about, you know, them in the boats, disciples going, what's Jesus talking about? Getting over from here. We know we're in the boat. We're going to get from here. We're going to go over there. You don't have to tell us this, Jesus. Why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus, who is God, knows what's coming that they don't. Right? If, if anybody would have told us in 2019, you know, you really need to get prepared because you need to get over from here to over to there. What? It's just another year. Isn't it ironic? I, I think about New Year's Eve 2019 into 20. It's, every people always like time for it's going to be this is the year for me it's going to be a great year we got the big glasses with 2020 on and what was God saying you have no idea what's coming what's the big deal God we've gone into other years before nothing's going to happen God says you don't know that but I do make sure you know me we'll be fine We've got in the boat and we've gotten... Don't we say that a hundred times to God? Yeah, we'll be fine. Well, let's see what happens. Because God knows the future people. Verse 34, and well, verse 35, In the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And verse 36, And when they had sent away the multitudes, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships around. And there arose, the word arose means something came from nothing. It was unexpected, it wasn't predicted. You know, these guys are sailors, they know the weather. Red sky at night, sailors to right, red sun, you know, sun in the morning, sailors take warning. They were taken by surprise. They were seasoned sailors. But something happened that even they didn't know. Because people, things happen in your life that even you don't know, but God does. And he's preparing us because he's so good to us. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship and it was now full. So we're in a boat starting to sink. Water's coming in. They're upset. They don't understand. How could this be? The weather was fine. And where was Jesus? He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Isn't this great? You know what's so important about this? If you, if, and you guys can remind me of this too. Remember when life is spinning out of control and chaos is crippling us with fear, God is never in chaos. He's never going, oh man, this is flicking, what's going on in China? I don't know what to do. He's not flicking, he's not freaking out. What's wrong with you guys? You got a little problem down there? A little upset? You know I'm God. I could have snapped my fingers. Or it'll be gone. He doesn't panic. You'll never see anywhere in the Bible where God panics. But you already know what's happening. And he was asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him. Can you imagine how they awoke him? I don't think they tapped him. Jesus, how you doing? Wake up! <laughs> And they awoke him, Master. And listen, they, the first thing they say, listen, it's an accusation. Do we ever do that when things are not going well? The first thing we do is accuse God. Instead of accusing anyone else, God gets to blame. Hey, don't you know we're going to die? And people, what's interesting, don't you know when they say perish, they're going to die. God says, no one's dying on my watch. I decide who lives and dies. Isn't it funny? We, we no, I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it. Or well, maybe so, maybe not. But you don't know that. Because it is appointed unto man once to die in Hebrews. But after that, the judgment. Only God decides that. And Jesus arose. I wonder if Jesus jumped up and said, what's wrong, guys? Or did he get up quietly? 
and calmly. And he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Instantly, instantly. And we can have time to go into that, but God is able to control the very fabric of time and space, molecules, weather, everything. And he said unto them, now did Jesus not know why they were afraid? He knew, but he wanted them to answer. Jesus said, why are you so fearful? It's kind of after the storm, right? He didn't ask them while it was there. After he calmed the storm, he kind of like looked around and says, looks nice to me. Why are you afraid? How is it that ye have no faith? And they responded properly. And this is how we need to respond, people. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, let's pray. What kind of guy is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. His disciples, they didn't know who Jesus was. It's like us. We know who he is. Does God have to constantly remind you? Hey guys, remember? I make your DNA. I hold atoms together. Oh yeah, I forgot. That's who you are. We forget. They forgot. God is constantly telling us through creation, do you know who I am? People, God is trying to explain to us that he already knows our problems. He knows what's headed our way tomorrow, even before we do. Yet he makes this promise, pass over to the other side. You do it in your own strength, you won't pass over to the other side. You know that I'm, am I the captain of your ship? Right? We used to sing that song in Sunday school. With Jesus in the ship, we can smile at the storm until he brings us home. Is Jesus the captain of your ship? I didn't realize this for many, many years. I've been the pastor of this church. That I didn't know our church sign out there. It has written underneath it, underneath it Jesus, our pilot, uh, Jesus, our captain, pilot me. It's taken from this scripture. I said, I never knew that was there. But it's there, or at least it was there in the old sign. Jesus is the captain of our ship, but is he the captain of your ship? Because if you're steering, he can't steer, and he won't fight for supremacy. You want to drive your ship? You want to drive your life? I'll just sit back. But you've got to trust me, and to trust me, you've got to love me. And to love me, you've got to prove that you love me by serving me. And if you serve me, I will do my part, and I will get you to the other side. Trust him and be not afraid. We all need to be reminded of that. Because I'm sure after you leave today, you go, this is a great message, I love that, Pastor. The next news flash you'll see, it'll go right out the door. The next problem that you have, it'll go right out the door. But God knows. But don't stay in that place for too long. Get back quickly. Return to him quickly. How do you do it? Lord, forgive me for doubting you again. Forgive me for questioning what you're doing in my life again. My goal and your goal is do I love you? Because we can't trick God. He already knows. And he goes, if I love you and you love me, what can possibly go wrong? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord. That if we so choose, Lord, you are the captain of our ship. The one who brings us to the other side. The one who knows what storm's coming, even before we know what's coming. And you know how everything ends. Let us heed your warnings. Let us get aboard. And the ticket has been paid for. It's with your own blood. It doesn't cost us anything. It's faith. It's accepting you and saying, Father... I believe that you died on the cross, you rose again the third day for me. You paid for my sins that needed to be paid for because I am a sinner that's been separated from you. And I want you and I love you. And I am thankful for one thing first, that you have offered forgiveness to me. 
And once we do that, and once we cry out to God, and we seek, and we turn from our old ways, and we cry out to God, He will adopt us into His family, and He goes from Creator to Father. And what father would not take care of his child? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand up. We're going to close with a song here.